So my name is Wayne Dysinger, and I'd like to welcome people as they join this webinar on chronic illness and trauma. So just a little bit about a little bit of background about myself for those of you who are not familiar. Um, I'm trained in family medicine and then also in preventive medicine. And for the last uh, many years, I've been focused on a new concept called lifestyle medicine. Um, I'm in Southern California in the Inland Empire area, which is just um, east of LA. And we have two clinics that are primary care clinics that uh, focus on this concept of lifestyle medicine. And lifestyle medicine really looks at root causes. So what's really uh, underneath uh, the, the disease that someone's dealing with, you know, whether it be diabetes, whether it be depression, whether it be fatigue, um, any, any issue that they're dealing with, what's really underneath it? Um, and what's the root cause? And, and frequently it's simple things like let's eat a little better, uh, let's exercise more, let's get a little more social interaction, let's, let's work on sleep. Uh, so we bring those things to the table and try to help our patients really heal naturally uh, with those types of things. Now, um, we're super excited this evening to have uh, Veronique Mead as a presenter for a webinar. We present webinars periodically um, from our practice. Um, and Dr. Mead is, is an expert in an area that is particularly important to us. We have a lot of patients who have chronic illnesses and, and it can be high blood pressure, it can be arthritis, uh, it can be um, any number of, of chronic uh, things, things that last for more than a couple uh, weeks or so is, is what's considered chronic. And we, we love to, again, get to the root cause of those. And it can be eating differently, but a lot of times it can be understanding your past better, uh, understanding trauma that's, that's occurred in your life, sometimes obvious trauma, sometimes subtle trauma, uh, and really trying to address that to, to look at the, the pathways, the neural pathways and the, the uh, ways of getting out of those neural pathways. So uh, Dr. Mead is going to uh, share with us uh, her research, uh, her understandings, and some of the insights that she's gained as she's uh, studied this over the years um, and as she's uh, dealt with it herself over the years. Um, so Dr. Mead actually is a colleague of mine from many years ago, uh, back uh, in, see, this would have been, I think, 1995. Um, we both were hired by Dartmouth Medical School. Dartmouth Medical School in, in New England, um, in the Northeast. Um, and we were hired to help start a family medicine residency. Uh, and we, we shared an office actually. So we would have wonderful conversations uh, over the, the little uh, um, <laughs> partition in the office. Um, and and it, was, it was a lot of work. Um, we worked very hard. Uh, we were two of, of four core faculty starting this residency. Um, but but we were successful. We we started a great residency there, um, and then and over the years we we've, we've managed to stay in touch. But uh, it felt really important uh, as her expertise has developed and as my as our practice lifestyle medical has developed uh, for her to spend some time talking with us uh, about um, how we can address um, trauma. From, from earlier years and use that to help us with chronic disease. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Mead and uh, hopefully her presentation will be something that's valuable to everyone. We will have a, a significant amount of time at the end for questions and answers. And uh, Dr. Mead will be the primary one uh, answering those questions, but I will be available as well. And uh, so from that, uh, a little further introduction to Dr. Mead. Um, she has um, a medical degree, um, trained in family medicine, uh, and then she has additional training in counseling. Um, and, and she's worked, uh, like I said, with me in Dartmouth. She's also worked uh, in the Southwest, currently is based in Colorado. Um, and her, her website is Chronic Illness Trauma Studies. Uh, she has, um, from what I can tell, uh, the best collection of resources for chronic illness trauma studies um, that's available on the web. Uh, so 
Dr. Mead, welcome. Uh, it's a privilege to have you here, and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks so much, Wayne. And I'm going to invite everybody to think of me, call me Veronique. And it's really great to be doing this together after all these years, kind of in the world that we've both or each ended up in. And so I'm going to jump in. Uh, I'm going to share three stories in my talk today to give some examples um, from trauma perspectives. And I'm also going to be sharing the science. And um, what I want to talk about is this sense I want to talk about research that I've been discovering over the past 20 years that I never knew about when I was in medicine and that I wish I had known about back then. And part of the theme is really the sense that what we're learning from the research is that a lot of symptoms really have to do with what happened to us rather than purely about genetics, for example. And when we think about trauma, a lot of times the concept of trauma, especially in medicine, is thought to be something that leads only to psychological symptoms. And so a lot of you guys who are listeners will very likely have had the experience of having been told, if you've mentioned any trauma from your past, that your symptoms may be all in your head or psychological. And one of my big sort of missions in having a blog and sharing the science is really to explain the clarity of what we're learning, how it's not in our heads. It's a mind-body thing that happens, but it's actually in our biology. And so I also have been discovering in the past 20 years how this is really a perspective about how chronic illness may not be as incurable as we've been thinking. It doesn't mean it's necessarily easy to overcome. Um, we don't always know what to what extent that's possible, but the concept of understanding how life experiences affect our health actually makes a difference in how we can work with it. And so it may also be preventable and it gives us empowering tools, which is what Wayne's clinic is really all about in my work as well. So I'm gonna be speaking from four major perspectives. One of having been a medical doctor, another of having been on the mental health side as a psychotherapist who ended up specializing as a trauma therapist. But I'm also gonna share my own story with chronic illness and that's had a huge um, impact on how I've been playing with the what I've been discovering over the past 20 years of diving into other people's research to answer questions, then pulling it together to help make sense of my symptoms, but also for the clients I was working with and now people who I regularly interact with on my blog. So I'm gonna talk about four categories of trauma that I'm gonna introduce. And I've seen some of Wayne's work talking about there being four pillars of health. And trauma really affects two of these in a major way. Our natural resilience and ability to heal is affected by trauma, and so is connection. Trauma tends to disconnect, whether it's from ourselves or from others or both. And then we're gonna have three pauses where we're gonna actually do a short practice that I'm gonna introduce as something that you can take with you. It'll be a place to start. There's also handouts. Uh, or a handout with a whole list of links that you guys can download. I think Arwen will be sending that with the email as well. Arwen's the support person here who's helping uh, manage and hold this container. And then we'll do the Q&A as Wayne was mentioning. So with my own chronic illness, I uh, 20 years ago when I was practicing medicine, when I was working with Wayne actually about 25 years ago, I started developing fatigue that would be intermittent. Some days I was completely normal and then there would be a day or two or three where I was so exhausted that it was actually hard to roll over in bed at night. And I really didn't know what this was all about. And over a period of 10 years, it actually got worse. So that was a very slow onset for me of something that ended up being diagnosed as chronic fatigue syndrome 
which is essentially a name for something, a diagnosis of exclusion, when there's there's no real biomarker or, or clear thing that helps us know that this is a particular chronic illness other than excluding other causes. I ended up having to stop working. Um, by that point, I had left medicine because I really felt there was something missing in what I had to offer, especially for folks with chronic conditions. And I had retrained as a somatic psychotherapist, specialized in trauma, had a private practice, and then had to stop working. And so this, like so many other chronic illnesses, had no cure. But I've been gradually recovering from when, at my very worst, about 10 years ago now, I was mostly bedridden. I had trouble sitting up for more than a few minutes at a time without feeling more exhausted or weak. Uh, and so this gradual recovery has really been affected by everything I've been learning that I, about trauma. And I'm gonna be sharing some of that here. So when I was studying somatic psychology, that's when I actually started to learn about trauma in a way I'd never heard about in medicine and how it's so much more subtle much of the time than we think. We tend to think it's big stuff like veterans who have served in the war or a war or experiencing abuse, but it's much more subtle than that. And, and what I also learned was all the different effects of trauma, they go beyond PTSD, but they include anxiety and depression, which are really common chronic symptoms, but also addictions and chronic pain. And it made me begin to wonder, is it possible that trauma could be a risk factor for chronic illness as well? And that's when I started to ask myself this question. If one of the things that we know or commonly recognize as a symptom of trauma is when, for example, a veteran who hears a car backfire may have a nervous system interpretation of that, that it's a gunshot. And without any conscious awareness, they may find themselves ducking, having sweaty palms, having their heart rate go through the roof if they have unresolved trauma. That's a very natural, protective, unconscious response that our nervous systems do. And so that's known as a trigger in the mental health field. And I wondered, that could be an interesting way to see whether I have chronic, a, a, a link to trauma for my own chronic illness. Are there any triggers for my own symptoms? And by that point, I had been sick for a number of years and instead of having fatigue sometimes and normal health other times, I now pretty much had a baseline of always being a certain level of quite tired. And so what I was looking for, was there anything that could trigger a flare up? And it took me a year, a year before I found the first trigger because triggers can be very, very subtle. They're usually not at all in our conscious awareness. And it was on this particular day that I noticed that my fatigue levels had really dropped for a couple hours. And then I realized it had happened right after a phone call. And on that phone call, there had been a little bit of conflict, nothing major at all. And that's a very recognizable clue about trauma, something very small in the present that can have a link to events in the past. And in my case, for example, who knows exactly what it was linking to, but there was some level of tension and conflict, especially between my parents in our household. And it was a kind of conflict that did never escalated in, into any kind of domestic violence, but it was a conflict that never really got resolved. And when we're children, we learn from our environments and so some, one of the things we can learn is that conflict is not resolvable and it can be very distressing. So that may have been one of the triggers for my own flare up. And so from there, I started discovering more and more research. This is Dr. Vincent Felitti, who was based at the University of California in San Diego. And he was one of two researchers, authors who authored this first paper published in 1998 about the adverse childhood experiences studies. And my guess is you, many of you guys may have heard about ACEs. This is the research that is making waves around the world and helping people from all kinds of different areas 
begin to recognize that the effects of trauma are real. They did a study with Kaiser Permanente patients, 17,000 patients, and looked at and found with their surveys that there were 10 particular types of trauma that had a very significant link to risk for chronic conditions later in life. So those 10 conditions, these 10 ACEs actually, here's a list of them. The first one, the loss of a parent can be through divorce or if your parents separate. Now this seems really, really mild. It does not seem significant enough to be a risk factor for something as serious as chronic illness. But what they found was that it didn't matter which of these ACEs you had or you had experienced up until about the age of 18. If you had experienced these, the more ACEs you had experienced, the greater your risk for chronic conditions. And that is known as an ACE score. You add up the number of these experiences, whether it's a parental mental illness or having experienced these different kinds of abuse, emotional or physical neglect, or these others having had a parent in jail, for example, or any family member. And so your ACE score has relevance to your later health. Now, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris is California's first Surgeon General, and she's been another major, one of the faces of ACEs. And she has written a book about it, which I'll tell you later in the talk. And these are among the many chronic conditions that have been found linked to ACEs. ACEs increase risk for heart disease and type 2 diabetes and other diseases of insulin resistance, for example, having bigger bodies addictions, and other chronic illnesses. And when I first found out about the ACEs, I had a what is a very common response, which was I didn't see any of those 10 ACEs as seeming to apply to me. My parents had stayed together. There was no domestic violence. None of those seemed to apply to me. So even though I was really excited to find this research, I still felt a big question mark. And when I looked also at these chronic illnesses, none of these illnesses seemed to apply to me specifically either because chronic fatigue wasn't in their study. And so for a number of years, I actually thought I had an ACE score myself of zero. But over time, the more I started to learn about trauma and the more I started to work with it personally as a client, working through what my sense was a nervous system pattern, that had been affected by my own experiences to influence my health, the more I began to realize that I actually had an ACE score of two. And one was an awareness I had in talking with my mother uh, just a few years ago and discovered that she has never cried as much as she did in the first two years of my life. And that would qualify as postpartum depression, which is actually much more common than we think and that actually qualifies as a mental illness. Um, we tend to think it's only the more, most severe kind of mental illnesses, but that qualifies. And then the other thing, emotional neglect, I've actually um, put this into its own entire category. I'd say it's one of the most invisible, unrecognized risk factors for chronic illness. And the concept of emotional neglect is not feeling seen or heard or believed, um, feeling judged, it not being okay to be who you are. And in my own family system, I had a lot of uh, love from my parents, but the big thing was that from their own unrecognized trauma, there was only a, a sort of a narrow range of what was manageable and acceptable for emotions in my family. And so if I, had difficult emotions, whether with anger or depression or anxiety or distress, something outside of this range, there wasn't really any capacity to support that. And as a result, I did one of those things that is also very common for many of us with chronic illness, is sort of becoming a people pleaser, a caretaker, being very supportive for my parents, in a way being the one who supported them emotionally, and that is a huge risk factor. 
because it means we end up learning how to override our own needs and wants and who we are. So an ACE score of two was found in another research study with ACEs. This is Dr. Dubey study, where if you have an ACE score of two, that means just a couple things. Maybe your parents got divorced and your mom had postpartum depression. You actually have a 70% chance of ever being hospitalized for an autoimmune disease, like type one diabetes, lupus, inflammatory bowel disease. And that's only a score of two, which to me was kind of jaw dropping to realize that. So in my own exploration um, with my health, one of the symptoms that I had along with chronic fatigue is irritable bowel syndrome. And for some people that's diarrhea or constipation or something in between or going back and forth or bloating or belly discomfort, it can be very severe. And this is often thought to be one of those psychosomatic illnesses, um, but it's still very, very real. And Trauma is a risk factor for this. And one of the things I was working on trauma therapy, chipping away at things, but at the same time, I was also developing pretty significant food intolerances over a 10 year period to the point where I became unable to tolerate carbs, pasta, dessert, bread, grains. And so I kept eliminating things. And eventually it was so severe that I changed my diet completely, went completely clean, got rid of all the carbs. And I did that for four years and it didn't change my food intolerances at all. It did help calm all of my symptoms down though. The IBS symptoms calmed down. It didn't change my fatigue, but bladder pain, a bunch of other things really stabilized. And that gave me more room to do more things to work with my health. But the, the really, big game changer. This was the biggest event I've ever had in my own experience of seeing a black and white almost change linked to trauma. And that was that in some of the therapy I was doing, I began to realize that I was really having a lot of anger towards my father because in our phone conversations, our occasional phone conversations, he ended up doing pretty much all of the talking um, rarely asked about me, what I was doing, how I was doing, what I was up to. I actually, and I'm going to share some symptoms here occasionally that, that can feel a little bit like too much information. But if you're dealing with a chronic illness, you've often experienced so many things that you may or may not talk about. Uh, and one of these times that I'd just gotten off the phone with my father is within a couple hours, I actually had an explosion of a hemorrhoid process that lasted for 10 days. And so these kinds of symptoms can happen if there's no other way to deal with an, something we can't overcome or we can't solve or we can't resolve. With this process of anger, I ended up setting a boundary with my dad just a few years ago. And it was pretty simple in the sense that I just said, look, if, we're, if we can't have a two-way conversation, I'm just going to kind of shift out of what requires a fair amount of effort for me and causes symptoms for me. And I'm just gonna kind of shift to a more superficial relationship. It did take me years and years to actually be able to set that boundary, which I didn't even know I needed to set. But within days, I ended up going out to eat at a Mexican restaurant with my husband and eating all these foods I'd had difficulty with for 10 years. So, it took another year and a half to really stabilize everything, but I can eat everything now. I still get occasional bloating, occasional symptoms. It's not completely resolved, but it shifted my symptoms, my symptoms pretty much overnight. So really what all of this information is helping to, is helping making sense of symptoms and I could give a talk on this slide alone for a few hours of talking about the mechanisms that we're starting to find that are influenced by trauma. And so trauma actually affects our nervous systems and our body's perceptions of threat versus safety. Again, this is not conscious. Our bodies are actually 
and our nervous systems and immune systems are influenced in a way that they're trying to protect us. When we experience trauma, it interrupts this cycle where our bodies are able to go into stress and then come back down. And our systems can get kind of stuck or caught in a place that continues to perceive threat and that continues to do everything it can for our survival. So that our bodies are actually caught in the past and causing symptoms over time if this gets stuck in our bodies and our systems. But trauma also affects gene function through this process of epigenetics. And that's where life experiences and environmental factors like diet attach molecules to our genes and turn them on or off. And so this has been one of the biggest shifts in thinking that I wish I'd learned about as a doctor, but also when my chronic illness first started. So we're gonna shift gears here and do a little practice that I mentioned we'd start. And so what I'd like you to do here is let's just take a moment and I want us to just come into the present moment and to notice where you are in the present and where your body makes contact. Maybe it's contact with the chair. That could be your bottom, could be your back. It could be feeling your feet on the floor. If you're lying down, it may be different points of contact. And just noticing what happens if you consciously bring your awareness into this moment. It may be looking at the picture or somewhere around you and specifically noticing things like color, like the many different colors of green in this picture. I have an orchid right next to my computer and so I can look at the different colors of the white and the little bits of yellow on it. So coming into this present moment, all we're doing is observing things as they are. And what this practice does, and we're gonna do two other practices in, in a little bit here. What this practice does is it actually interrupts the unconscious process most of us are in all day long, where we're not quite fully paying attention and whatever is coming in and out of our heads and our thoughts, whatever the beliefs may be, are kind of going on all the time and are kind of reacting like triggers. They may be stimulating survival responses in our day, in our nervous systems. And so by actually pausing, coming into the present moment very consciously, we're interrupting that. It's like an antidote. And what we're sending is more in the direction of sense of safety. So if I'm noticing color, if I'm noticing how I am sitting in my chair, if I'm noticing that um, I'm actually here right now, that actually sends a different message to the nervous system. And this is a practice of mindfulness. I'm not talking about meditation. I'm just talking about present moment mindfulness. And this is something that I do pretty much all day long at this point, whenever I think about it, with whatever I'm doing. And so we can do this, you guys can do this anytime as well, and it can become a practice. And there's a link to a wonderful mindfulness talk by John Kabat-Zinn in the handout that you guys will be getting. So as we shift to the next sort of segment here, the common medical view still, from what I hear regularly for folks on my blog is, how chronic illness is really a sense of, it's the perception that it's purely physical, that there's something broken in the body, that we actually need to do something like pills or medications. And this concept again of incurable. But what I've been finding over the past 20 years in pulling the research is it's actually a much different process, an intelligent process. And this concept of chronic illness being like an undersea volcano that develops over time, over years, came from a researcher in multiple sclerosis, Dr. Charles Poser. And what I've pulled together is different kinds of trauma. In this case, events that happen in babyhood, I call it, or in childhood like the ACEs, but also before onset, 
to gradually increase the, the risk and gradually strengthen certain pathways of survival that end up leading to symptoms. So let me tell you about Ren. Ren gave me uh, permission to share her story. This is not her actual name or her picture, but uh, I'll tell you some about what uh, she's shared with me. So Ren Scott had two type two diabetes since about 2016. She was 56 when she was diagnosed. And she's been an active gardener her whole life, a vegetarian. She was a manager, had a pet company at one point. And before her diagnosis, she had a desk job, so she was pretty sedentary. And she had also gained weight. Um, she also had a very significant family history of type 2 diabetes, which is very common. Um, her parents, both her parents, siblings, cousins, we see this very often in type 2 diabetes, which makes it seem like it's primarily genetic. From what we tend to think in medical perspectives, and this comes even from the World Health Organization um, this past year, we tend to think that risk for type 2 diabetes is primarily because of lifestyle factors, whether it's overeating, uh, having bigger bodies, or being sedentary. And that kind of fits with what the picture we see with Wren. But there can be, for many folks, an element here of judgment, um, of blame in a way, of really saying, look, you're not doing things right. You may have caused your chronic illness by how you're leading your life. And while it means that there may be things we can do, I kind of started to see this from a different perspective with the research. And the new understanding, if we come back again to this concept that something like type 2 diabetes may have begun a very long time ago, we begin to ask different questions of ourselves and from our histories and get different perspectives. And the risk, it's not everyone who's going to develop a chronic illness or chronic symptoms. It's really about having had, had more adversity and adverse experiences than positive, nurturing, supportive ones. And so that our bodies, which are really innately able and designed to heal on their own, have gotten overwhelmed and out of balance. So when you look at Ren's history, it turns out that when she was born, she weighed under six pounds. I made a mistake here. She wasn't actually born cesarean, um, although cesareans have been found in a recent study in 2020 to be linked to increased risk for type 2 diabetes. But weighing six pounds is actually a very common association with type 2 diabetes. And there was a study done uh, that found that they picked about seven pounds as a fairly common normal birth weight and looked at what is the risk if you go down from seven pounds. And they found that for every decrease in birth weight, the risk for type two diabetes increased. And so this fact that she was born six pounds is a whole factor associated with risk that we generally don't think about in medicine or as a person with chronic illness. And I'm gonna talk about that more in just a second with the next slide. The other thing that you may have already seen on the slide is that she has an ACE score of eight. Eight is astronomical. Um, and what it says is that she pretty much had almost all of those risk factors, those types of trauma that we saw earlier with the ACEs. And one of the things that's helpful about an ACE score is you can tell your doctor, you can tell someone what your ACE score is, and you don't actually have to tell them what specific events you experienced it doesn't matter which ones you experienced in the sense of risk. It certainly has a big impact on what you experienced. And, and Ren has said, you know, that number just doesn't seem to be helpful to or, or really appropriate for the amount of distress and trauma that she experienced in her own life. But so that's another risk factor. Her entire childhood had a lot of events. Now for this next type of category of trauma, babyhood, childhood, and now this other one, which is about onset triggers. Before she was diagnosed, she had just gotten, um, a few years before, I believe, she'd gotten divorced for the second time. 
and both of her marriages had been abusive, which suggests that there was abuse in the household when she was growing up and that that was part of how she hadn't developed a nervous system and a capacity in her own being to tell what a safe person might be like. And so she'd been divorced now twice. She'd had to leave her farm and that's when she'd changed to a sedentary uh, job. But she'd also had diverticulitis, had had to be hospitalized, developed a hole in her intestine, had to have surgery, had a very serious infection and in sepsis, and was in the intensive care unit and nearly died. That is actually a big part of the picture of what happened right before she was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. This is much more common. Uh, this is a much bigger, more serious set of onset triggers than we often see or experience with our chronic illnesses. But it really highlights, if you're not looking for this, we don't tend to share this with our doctors. Our doctors don't tend to ask us about this. But that's a lot of trauma that happened in a very short period. And in a way, it's remarkable, I find, with that amount of trauma history, with the ACE score, with the family history, that she didn't develop type 2 diabetes before she turned 56. And to me, that speaks to a ton of resilience of just how much capacity our bodies have and what it can take to kind of tip us over the edge. So a little more of the science. Dr. David Barker was a researcher who ended up looking at women who experienced a siege during the Dutch hunger winter in World War II, starvation, and the total emotional stress of having been under siege during that period of time. And what they found was, from looking at 20,000 moms and babies, was that prenatal stress, whether it's physical and nutritional or emotional, actually has an impact on risk for chronic illness later in life. And it may affect birth weight. A low birth weight often reflects prenatal stress. And so what we begin to see here is a picture from the science of just how much we're learning about the role of life experiences with chronic illness. And Dr. Hawkins has one of the articles I find to be the most helpful overview of these fetal origins of adult disease, FOAD, um, and what I've started calling adverse babyhood experiences or ABEs, just to start to line up this concept with adverse childhood experiences. So in babyhood, adversity has been associated with risk for all of these chronic illnesses. They're essentially the same chronic illnesses that are associated with risk with ACEs. And so when we look at Wren's history, we see that there are a number of risk factors from things that happened to her that, the, that ended up being risk factors for her type 2 diabetes and not just lifestyle. So when you look at the research, and I have a blog post on type 2 diabetes um, that looks at actually eight categories of trauma that affect risk. And what the studies are finding is that all of these categories of adversity in babyhood and in childhood are risk factors themselves for having a body that is more easily made a bigger body, maybe by not even eating as much as other folks. It's the same thing that can increase risk for overeating. Overeating can happen because we're actually trying to self-medicate or self-soothe or comfort for overwhelming feelings that we actually don't know how to deal with, trauma feelings, the effects of trauma. And there's also research finding that uh, when you have had experiences of trauma, you have a higher chance of having symptoms of freeze. This is what my chronic fatigue symptom feels like to me is a body that wasn't able to fight or flee and that instead had to shut down. This is the survival response of last resort. And when we're in a free state, it's really hard to be motivated. It's really hard to want to do things. And so that can actually show up as a sedentary lifestyle, not just because we have a desk job. 
So whether it's overeating or having a body that may be more sensitive to gaining weight, these are all factors that look like they're the cause of type 2, two diabetes, but I really see it as these are symptoms of past trauma that can tip us over into the edge, uh, over past the edge into a chronic illness if we go past some magic line and get gain maybe just a little bit too much weight or have just a little too much stress or trauma later in our lives, like Ren did before the onset of her type 2 diabetes. So today, Ren is actually doing really well. She's on one medication, metformin. Her doctor for the past few years had been wanting to increase her meds. And she was telling me how recently she was tracking how her blood sugars were really kind of out of whack. And she realized that it really seemed to be stress related. And when she actually came up with how to deal with this particularly big stressor in her life, the moment she realized what she could do about it, even if she hadn't done it yet, her blood sugars came back into the normal range in the 90s. And what she's found is that it, for her, it hasn't actually been what she eats. She's found that she can actually regulate her blood sugars, even if she's just doing something like uh, meditative walking or walking meditation. It's the same effect for her as, as if she clears out the snow from her driveway. And so nutrition, she's been a vegetarian, eats very low carb, has worked at stress reduction, and also has actively been doing trauma therapy. And so all of these things, the lifestyle medicine approach and bring in a trauma awareness have been a huge factor in helping her gain regulation for her type 2 diabetes. And she's gained a really great team around her since then too. So we're gonna switch again here to take another practice break. So present moment again, I'm just noticing. So I'm noticing my own bottom in my chair. I can feel my feet on the floor. Um, looking at colors, noticing your breath. If you're holding your breath, if you're breathing fast. And what I want to add is another tool here, which is non-judgment. And in a mindfulness practice, not going into judgment is part of this approach, part of this way of coming into being in the present and simply noticing things as they are. So we may notice when we pause like this for a moment throughout the day that we're aware of a particular symptom. Maybe it's our body size and we have judgment about that. For me with chronic fatigue, I often was caught in this push, 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 wanting to do more. If I happen to have a better day, I wanted to do all the things that I couldn't do for the past few days. And in this practice moment, it would be how to not judge myself for having pushed too hard and maybe cause some symptoms. It's also noticing if you have beliefs, thinking maybe it's your fault or that you're weak. And here too, if you notice judgment, it's noticing it and then letting that go. And one of the things I find helpful when I'm in this present moment state is to sometimes even think about my nervous system and my body is actually doing the best that it can. It's in a survival mode because it thinks it's trying to protect me and because it's caught in the past still. And this is just how it is in this moment. And for me, slow, I'm slowing down here, taking this break. I don't always slow down when I check in and come into the present moment. I just come in to notice where I am. But in this process right now, it slows me down a little bit, helps me be a little focused again, because giving a talk, there's excitement and energy and so many things I want to share with you guys. And so it can be an opportunity to pause and catch your breath and reorient as well to like what's going on right now.
So we're going to shift gears again to our third and last section. And this is Chrissy's story. And this is one of the most exciting stories I find for sharing. This um, Chrissy was nine years old when a friend of mine, Tony Madrid, started working with her. And her asthma was pretty serious, pretty severe. She was in the emergency room a couple times a month. She was on a lot of medications, including steroid medications. And she and her mom had gone to Tony's office. He's a psychologist. And he and his group had worked with them for quite a while. Things like relaxation, guided imagery. And Chrissy would get better for maybe a few hours but then her asthma would come back. And so after a, quite a while, they decided to stop. And Christy's mom decided that she would like to continue therapy. And one day as she was getting ready to leave Tony's office, she said to him, she gave him a clue. And it was really hard for her to say this, but she said, you know, I don't feel love for my daughter. That's a huge statement. It's a huge thing to reveal. It's not how we expect to feel around our kids. But for Tony, it was a clue. His wife had just given him a book that she said, I don't need to read this book. They'd had a, they were, they just had a baby or going to have a baby. And she felt she was pretty clear about what needed to happen. But two pediatricians had writ written a book about bonding and they had discovered once we started having hospitalized births, we started separating moms and babies as a routine, thinking it might help moms to rest after birth. They started noticing that there seemed to be this seemed to be causing problems, and they were noticing symptoms. And so this book was all kinds of research about bonding disruptions, and this clue, "I don't feel love for my baby," was what changed. Tony's perspective completely, and he ended up trying something else. Before I tell you what he did, uh, it's kind of like type 2 diabetes. We have a common view of asthma, all of these kinds of risk factors, including pollution and toxins in the environment, the family history. But a lot of the ones here on this page didn't really seem to apply to Chrissy. She wasn't in a bigger body. She wasn't a smoker. I don't know more of her history. But this does not help us find a cure for asthma generally. But for what Tony found when he looked at, were there any events that might have caused bonding disruptions? Events he'd learned about in this book. And here again with adverse babyhood events, he found a whole slew of things that Chrissy's mom had experienced. Chrissy's dad had left during the pregnancy Labor, during labor, Chrissy's mom's mother had been there and had harangued her during the whole labor. The labor room nurse had insulted her. She'd been delivered by a different doctor, a stranger, someone she'd never met. And then when Chrissy was born, she was jaundiced and she had to be taken away for treatment. And so Chrissy's mom didn't see her baby for eight hours. This can be really common. When Wayne and I were working together, we practiced obstetrics. We supported women and families during labor and delivery. And I remember, you know, babies often spend time in the nursery. And we thought of that as routine. We really, I never thought about it twice. Um, or maybe that's not entirely true. I really felt that I wanted babies to spend time with mom, but I didn't have any of the research. I didn't understand why I had that feeling. And so it just seemed like something normal. But what the research is being found, what the research is showing is that when you separate moms and babies after they've been together as close physiologically as you can possibly ever be, when you separate them after birth, it can actually interfere with the natural capacity for bonding. And stressful and traumatic events can also cause separation, emotional separation, physical separation, and so when Chrissy had then gone home, she'd actually had to be hospitalized again afterwards. And when her mom finally saw her after that hospitalization, she told Tony, it had felt as though like this did not feel like my baby. That is one of the biggest clues to bonding disruptions 
and it's an indicator of separation. And the reason this is important is that babies, when we're babies, our nervous systems are immature, our physiology is immature, and we actually need our adult caregivers to help our bodies regulate. So when there's emotional or physical separation, it actually provides less regulation for our bodies. And it can mean that nine years later, like happened for Chrissy, that her mother still couldn't feel that sense of love for her daughter. So what Tony did, this is Tony Madrid, psychologist in California, who I met 20 years ago when I first learned about this story, and he's been doing this work for 30 years now. What he did was he took Chrissy's mom and he did either EMDR or hypnosis with her, and he worked through with her all of those events that had disrupted her experience of pregnancy, labor, and birth. And that caused a huge change. Chrissy's asthma actually went away completely, resolved, cured. And this is what Tony's been finding in his research for 30 years. This is part of why I find this so exciting is there's such a clear link here between identifying what the trauma is, working to heal it, and then finding that it can cure chronic illness. And it's not even in the mom, it's in the baby. So this is part of what I think is so exciting and potentially empowering about understanding and recognizing what trauma looks like and how it affects us. So this sense is that when there's too much adversity, it increases the risk over time. There are antibodies that we see for autoimmune diseases for 10, 13, 15 years before the onset. That I think provides opportunities to intervene and maybe prevent risk. Because what we're also finding is that when there's enough support, when there's repair, what Tony did you could say would be repair after events happened because trauma is pretty much in inevitable. As humans, we all experience all kinds of stressors, all kinds of trauma, but repairing that can have a huge impact on either preventing chronic illnesses or helping us when we do get sick. So really, what is a definition? This is my favorite definition. It's from a neurologist who is a friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Robert Scare. It's any negative life event that happens when we're in a state of relative helplessness. So it could be a car accident. It could be a medical procedure. It could be the sudden loss of someone we love. It could be these events that happen for Chrissy's mom because pregnancy is a place and a, a state of really quite relative vulnerability. Babies and children are really vulnerable because we're completely dependent on our adult caregivers for survival. And so those are periods, babyhood and childhood, when we're, we're most sensitive to things that might not impact us as, as much as adults. So I myself had asthma. And when I learned about all these things, I got curious about my history because I'd never thought about that before. I was hospitalized a couple times as a child. I was still taking medications and inhalers, including steroid inhalers, even as an adult. And when I look back on it and asked my mom, it turns out that not only did she move to another country when she was pregnant with me, which I had known about, and she didn't speak the language, but my dad also in the 1960s wasn't allowed in the delivery room until after I'd been born. But what also happened is that my mom also had another baby 15 months later, and then her dad died. And here she was in another country where she didn't speak the language. She'd lost her most, almost all of her support system. And so the research also helps us see that postpartum depression doesn't come out of the blue. It's actually a normal reaction and normal response to a lot of adversity that leads here too to emotional separation. And so my mom, uh, her labor ended up feeling really, really long. Her doctor had suggested an epidural. When she got it, it was really painful, very, very painful. I came out right after that, and we had a period of bonding. 
the way my parents both describe it, where we were looking deeply into each other's eyes and there was this quiet space. And so that's an example of resilience that's built into our systems. But what happened after is my mom ended up having a spinal headache, which is a side effect sometimes from epidurals. And so she couldn't even lift her head up off the pillow. And she describes that breastfeeding didn't work. And this is something that those two researchers in bonding discovered, the two pediatricians, is that when there's difficulty breastfeeding, it's actually an indication of potential bonding disruptions. So that in its own nutshell was another set of risk factors for me with asthma, but very likely also for my chronic fatigue. So in my own healing journey, what I've been looking at has been how do I work with my own experiences during these four categories, whether it's in the past, in babyhood and childhood, the stressors for me that happened before I got sick, a lot of them were really about practicing medicine, witnessing trauma uh, as a doctor, because there's a lot of vicarious trauma in, that, in this field, but then also working with triggers in the present. And ultimately, I've really used all of these tools, the lifestyle tools with changes in nutrition, walking a couple times a day, really moving, but also decreasing stressors such as changing careers, and then reconnecting to myself. A lot of that has been through trauma therapy that I've been doing over the past 20 years and learning how to stop overriding my own needs and who I am and learning how to listen to what my body's been saying and what my body's been needing. It's all been a process of rebuilding a sense of safety. And I am doing tons and tons better. I can work full time writing and blogging, although I haven't yet gone back to the extra capacity I would need to go back to being a psychotherapist because of this extra amount of regulation that's needed when working with trauma. So, as an overall message I want you guys to get, you don't have to know all the science, but I wanted to share it so you would really get some clarity if anyone ever tells you again that it's all in your head. And I also want you to know that not all of us get sick. Not all of us are stuck when we're sick or being sick forever, that the things we do really can make a difference even if it does take extra time, effort, and courage to do this kind of work, as well as a lot of perseverance. And in the handout, uh, I'm going to, there are links for things on my website that could be very helpful. I have a blog post on 11 tools for healing. I have a separate blog post on different trauma therapies I recommend that are body-based, specifically oriented for working with trauma if that's of interest as an additional tool to add in your own work. And I also have all kinds of free eBooks. There's also California Surgeon General again, she's written a fantastic book on ACEs, The Deepest Well. And you can find this book on Amazon. There's a link in the handout for this one. It'll tell you about ACEs, about the science, and how she works and has worked in her pediatric practice to help parents and kids. Because it's not about blame. It's about how do we work with this once we have this information, because it gives us so much more awareness and it gives us things that we can do. And then you may have heard about Gabor Mate, who's a family practice doctor who speaks now all around the world about trauma. And his book, When the Body Says No, is a series of chapters with stories from different people with different kinds of chronic illnesses, where he really kind of highlights the kinds of adversity and trauma they've experienced in their lives as well. So we're going to take a third practice session here. And what I want to introduce with this is self-compassion. So again, coming into the present, Noticing what parts of your body make contact with the chair or the couch or the floor, wherever you happen to be. Noticing what your breath is doing without needing to change anything. Maybe orienting to the picture if that has any interest or appeal, noticing the colors. When I look at it, I actually feel a little sense of peace 
And with this mindfulness practice, we're not actually trying to make anything happen. We're just noticing what happens. And so for me to look at that picture, I actually have a little bit of settling and a little bit of more space in my belly area. Now in this place with self-compassion, what might happen when we pause and come into the present moment, there's times when I have plans to do a bunch of work as my next steps and I pause for a moment and I realize, oh, I'm actually kind of tired. I'd like to take a nap. And this is a form of self-compassion. What you would do if this was a child or your grandchild might be to say, oh, you're tired? Let's put you into bed and tuck you in. It's sort of how do we listen and then support what our body is actually telling us it may need. It may not want to do the next task. It may need to slow down or change gears or change relationships. It's also about if you're aware of symptoms here, how do you have compassion for these symptoms? They're not your fault. They're not something you're doing on purpose. How do we just accept things in this moment, just as they are, so we can notice what they are specifically? So I'm going to shift gears now. I'm just going to highlight these are the three things that I talked about with mindfulness. And John Kabat-Zinn, with that link, can share more information about that, where you can learn if you want to explore mindfulness meditation, for example. And he does eight-week programs. There are people trained that do this all around the country. Um, and he has worked very specifically with folks with chronic pain and chronic illness using this model. So what we're going to do next is we're going to shift to q and I'm going to have you guys put questions in the chat. I'm going to take a look through this and start to look through your questions and respond to them. If you have a chronic illness, I'd love it if you would put what that is so I have a bit of an idea of um, what chronic illness you have. So I might speak to it if there's any particular research I might share with that. And so I'm just going to take a look here. And so while I am starting to look at the chat, I'll just invite you to practice this present moment piece. And whether it's looking at this image or looking around where you are at colors and just seeing what that's like to be in this moment. So the very first question Kim Punch mentions, many cannot even practice mindfulness. I think that's absolutely true. Many can't practice meditation either. And so this is going to speak to, for many of us, what we need to find are tools that are unique for us. Meditation, for example, is often too much for many of us because we may actually go straight down into the difficult things that are thoughts that we can't get away from or sensations that can go into overwhelm. When I first started meditating, my body would go straight into such profound exhaustion that I had trouble coming out of it later. It was like I went into more freeze states. So I don't know if that's quite what you're asking. There's practicing mindfulness as a tool of learning how to do that. But there's also that some of these practices are not going to be the right fit. And in my uh, blog post link to 11 tools, it's really about what within the nutritional world or the movement or the trauma therapies or these other kinds of tools, what pulls you, what draws you, what feels like something that might be a fit for you. And then when we do it, one of the big things with chronic illness that I've discovered is we tend to need to try everything in a very small dose. Small amounts of medications if we try them or supplements or vitamins, small amounts of any practice that we try because our systems are actually very sensitive and super sensitive to stress and also super sensitive to us trying to change anything in our system. And that's something that we often tend to learn the hard way over time. And Kim, you mentioned again the Germanic New Medicine. There are actually all kinds of 
people and approaches that are emerging now that hold a very similar philosophy. It's really exciting because it comes in so many different forms and different research areas with different terms, but that's all saying the same thing, which is really actually supportive of how real this is. So Melissa asks, are some mental health trauma therapy modalities more effective than others to treat chronic illness? Or are they all equally effective? I don't know. I think we each tend to find practices, approaches, and therapies that work best for us. For me, I've actually been really sold on the trauma therapies, the somatically based trauma therapies that work with listening to our bodies by paying attention to sensations, imagery, impulses, things that are not in our conscious thoughts or conscious awareness because trauma is not accessible through conscious awareness. So cognitive behavioral therapies are the most well-known in part because they're the most well-studied. And there are some arms or branches of the CBT world that are now starting to work with trauma. And Dr. Nadine Burke Harris describes an example in her book where it's effective and helpful. But most CBT folks and most therapists are not actually trained in trauma. So my sense is you want to find a therapist, if you can, who has some experience in training with trauma. And the more experience they have, especially if they're working with their own trauma, the more capacity and awareness and non-judgment and flexibility that they can have in working with you. Um, so on my therapies page in that link, the semantically based, these are all trauma therapies where therapists are actually trained very specifically in working with trauma. And you can use those therapies for working with any of the effects of trauma, whether it's mental health conditions or addictions or other behaviors um, or chronic illness. I think there's less experience in working with chronic illness because this is still a relatively new way of thinking. And so, you know, in medicine, we tend to not think about psychotherapy or psychological conditions. And in psychology world, we don't tend to think about the chronic illness piece. And so I've been trying to bridge that with the model that I'm working with. And so it may still be that if someone has that trauma experience, even if they've never worked with chronic illness, but they happen to be and feel like a good fit that you can work together and see how that fits. L. Friedland, you ask about intergenerational trauma. I call this a whole other category all to its own, adverse multi-generational experiences or aims. And then the question that you're asking is what about trauma from for example, being descendants of Holocaust survivors? And are there any books or practitioners or practices that deal with this? I have a blog post, a couple of them, and on AIMS, and I actually went to Europe. I was able for the first time in 30 years to go to Europe, and even with my chronic fatigue, because I wanted to go do a series of workshops with someone who works very specifically with intergenerational trauma, but also chronic illness and other kinds of trauma. So the intergenerational trauma, adverse multi-generational effects, Stephen uh, Hausner is one of these folks who works in a group format that can work with multi-generational traumas. And on my, uh, in my blog post, there's a blog post on books and one on therapies. I have a whole list of books for working with very specific kinds of trauma and finding therapists and therapies and books for working with specific kinds of trauma. And there's research such as by Dr. Rachel Yehuda, who specifically looked at the impacts of the Holocaust. And what she's found is that the next generations actually do have more sensitivity to stress and PTSD. I think that's actually my phone that's making noise here. All right. <laughs> 
I'm looking to see what the next questions are here. I see a remark from my number one supporter, Alfred. <laughs> I've got all kinds of friends here. We have all kinds of community in this group here. It's so great to see you guys. Uh, Arwen, uh, Beverly, you ask about the handout. Arwen, I believe, is going to be sending the handout in the email with the recording of today's talk. And he's also put a link in the chat for Beverly. So that would have probably been a little while ago. Oh, Barb Kelly, type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes has been the one autoimmune disease that I have done the most research on because it tends to actually have the most research that's been done. For whatever reason, the research community in type 1 diabetes has been looking at all kinds of these risk factors, even though I don't think I have yet to hear of any doctors in this field that know about the trauma. Um, but there was a research study, for example, in Sweden, published, I believe, in 2015, where they studied 10,000 people starting at birth with no randomization. They just picked everybody in a community for 10,000 people, followed them for 14 years, and tracked their antibodies. And when they were two and a half years old, they found that the kiddos that had antibodies related to type 1 diabetes had had more experiences of adversity than the kids who did not. They were toddlers at this age, and they were looking specifically at um, their parents, their mothers having experienced domestic violence. And it might, the other thing they looked at might have been divorce. And so already these kids had had three times more experiences of adversity than the ones without the antibodies. And when they followed these kids for another 10, 12 years, the kids who developed type 1 diabetes had had three times more of all kinds of different adverse experiences than the kids who did not. And from all kinds of different research studies in type 1 diabetes, um, all kinds of adversities, um, cesarean sections are risk factors for all kinds of autoimmune diseases. There was a study published just last year in Denmark where they followed people for 40 years after being born cesarean and looked at four specific inflammatory diseases, type 1, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and inflammatory bowel disease. And the rates were all higher in those who had been born cesarean. Now, the whole question of cesareans, I'm going to shift gears into that, um, is a big question because cesareans absolutely save lives. But we've also started doing cesareans without any medical indication, and sometimes out of convenience for the doctor or for the patient or because people have already had cesareans and we're doing repeat cesareans more often. And that can affect the microbiome, the gut flora, if the baby doesn't go through the vaginal canal. But it also ca can cause separation. There's, there's often physical separation of mom and baby, but that can also lead to emotional separ separation. And cesarean sections can be quite stressful, especially if they're done because the baby's in distress or because the mom has a serious condition. And so there can maybe all kinds of reasons. And my guess is it may not be the cesarean itself, but that that is just one factor that then gets followed up by other kinds of adverse events that get out of balance and that that's part of what affects risk. And if we come back to type one diabetes, I think it's a really helpful model because if we were tracking antibodies and could see whether they're being affected by adversity, we could also explore whether all of these kinds of things we're talking about here, and I know I, I, I'm not focusing on all the treatment in this talk, can't kind of cover all that part, but if we were to introduce more support, um, there's a study showing, a very small study of fa five families where the siblings who had antibodies didn't develop type 1 diabetes, those siblings were the ones who had actually had more support. They might have had a, a friend 
or someone in their life that they could go to. So that I think would be a really interesting and helpful research to do to see, can we track antibodies and use that for prevention using what we know from trauma perspectives and what we can do to reduce the effects of trauma or repair those effects. And Frida, I see you were recently diagnosed with ALS. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. These, these chronic illnesses are so, so tough. I do think there's research linking adversity to risk for ALS. I'm not positive. It's not one I've spent a lot of time looking at. But every time I look into a chronic illness specifically, I find links to research about the role of adversity. And to me, what that suggests is it doesn't matter what chronic illness you have. Applying this approach, learning more about trauma, getting an understanding of what trauma looks like, what the effects are, and how you work with it may make a difference. It may actually make a significant difference. So I would take a look at that as an option. And Joe Richardson, you ask about POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is often a bouncing back and forth between really high and low blood pressure, um, getting lightheaded very easily. If you move from one position to another, it can be completely disabling. And what we see in the more well-known effects of trauma, if we look at PTSD, for example, the symptoms that we see tend to be a nervous system that lives or spends a lot of time outside a certain window of tolerance, it's called. And so within this window, our bodies are in a healthy, balanced capacity. Outside of it, we're in more extreme survival states of fight flight or down here and freeze. And in PTSD, people spend a lot of time either going back and forth outside this range, or they spend a lot of time in one or the other. And my guess, my sense is that that's what's happening with POTS as a reflection of all kinds of different types of adversity that have led the nervous system to not be regulated within this mode, but to more be acting in a regulated mode for survival above or below. And so there too, these approaches and ways of thinking about trauma may be helpful. My own blood pressure, for example, um, when I was in medicine is when my chronic fatigue was just starting and I had very low blood pressure. It was 90 over 70, let's see, yeah, pretty much 90 over 70, 90 over 60, when the normal is about 120 for the top number and 80 over the bottom. And that's when my fatigue was just beginning. And I look back on that now and see that as very likely a state of relative freeze in my system. And as I've worked with my health over the past 20 years from these trauma perspectives, my blood pressure has actually come back up. And it's generally in the 100 to 120 range now on top and around 80 on the bottom. All right, SAR going on to next, asthma and Crohn's. So I would think about similar risk factors um, to the things I've talked about here. Crohn's is often thought about as an autoimmune disease. There's a wonderful book by pediatrician Rachel Naomi Remen. It's called Kitchen Table Wisdom. I don't know if you've heard about it, but she tells stories in this book and she herself as a pediatrician, she herself developed Crohn's when she was about 12, I believe. And at that time, she's in, she's in her late eighties now, but when she was diagnosed, her life expectancy was thought to be about 40. And here she is in her late eighties. She's had a full active career, taught medical students and used all of the kind of tools that we're talking about here. And so that book might be uh, offer some inspiration or support for the process you're working with. Let's see. Tardive syndrome, tardive dyskinesia caused by prescription drugs. That is a question I don't know the answer to about how much reversibility is there 
when we have symptoms that have been caused by a chemical that has been put in our body. But I would be curious, what is possible? How far can we go in working with any symptoms at all? Um, is it possible that tardive dyskinesia could be linked to a stress response in our system that's interacting with the medications that we're trying to treat something? I don't know, but I would, I would hold that question and wonder about it. All right, Melissa, you've been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. You've also struggled for years with food allergies and intolerances that seem to come and go. Sometimes you can tolerate them and sometimes you can't. That's fascinating. When you say sometimes you can and sometimes you can't, my trauma nervous system perspective hat would wonder are the times when you have more tolerance or capacity, times when you have more support, times when you feel more safe or relaxed, are they times when your nervous system is getting either less trauma input, maybe from the past, or more safety input? And this sort of on and off or higher or lower symptoms is something that I think is a great indication that there's still range and more wiggle room. When I first got my chronic fatigue, it was on and off. I had good days or weeks where I was completely normal. And then I had a few days at a time where I would kind of crash. And over time, my own chronic illness developed very slowly. And those periods of crashes or lower energy would last longer. The normal periods were less. And eventually, I developed this whole new baseline where I was always somewhat tired. And then over the years, that baseline kept getting worse. And then as I've gotten better, it's really been the reverse of that. And so this fact that your body still has some back and forth means that it still has that much more resilience than when our body is more sort of baseline all the time caught in that. And so what I would say is that that suggests more capacity and um, using the kind of tools we're talking about today may help uh, just continue to widen that range back out again. Anjo Kane, you have chronic neurological Lyme and ME. I have um, a new series I started on my blog called Crillogs for chronic illness weblogs, where people are sharing their stories. And I'm working right now with someone who has chronic Lyme, and she shares her own story, which is primarily one linked to emotional neglect throughout her childhood. And so that's one of the processes she's been really working with. My guess is it's not a particular trauma that's linked to a particular chronic illness. And I don't know what your history is, but there is definitely evidence that trauma and adversity is a risk factor for chronic conditions that are linked to chronic infections that our bodies either can't overcome or that they are perpetually struggling with or that our bodies are working with a perception of threat that's gotten strengthened from having had an, an infection because infections are a form of threat also. And if our cells can't overcome the threat, they too can go into a survival response of danger signaling that gets stuck in an on survival response position. There's a research at the researcher at the University of California uh, San Diego, I believe, Dr. Robert Navio, who's done research on this, and he calls this the cell danger response and links this very specifically to all kinds of threats that also include infections. Epstein-Barr, heavy metal, mold toxicity, SAR, you're talking about that. All of these kinds of environmental stressors can trigger a trauma response. And in Robert Navio's work with a cell danger response, he looked at people with chronic fatigue and did a small study. And what he found was that in the year or two before diagnosis, all of the folks had experienced one or more of 
four or five categories of threat exposure. Psychological or physical trauma um, were two of the categories. Infections, biological exposures, toxins, and then chemical exposures um, like pollution or maybe the medication that can cause tardive dyskinesia, that type of thing. And most people had experienced more than one kind of threat like this. And this is also what I see in all kinds of chronic illnesses that I've been looking at over the years. And so it does not appear to have to be a particular kind of threat that can tip us over into a chronic illness. It's more likely that we've had a series of exposures throughout our life. And I think very likely adverse experiences have been a significant part of that. And it's probably not only infections or not only exposures to chemicals or toxins that, that end up leading to chronic illness. And that working from a trauma perspective can help calm or resolve the threat response at the cellular level or the nervous system level, regardless of what the trigger was for the chronic condition that we have. So I'm going to look in through and see if there's anything else that's different here from what we're talking about. I see type two diabetes from Darl, not being able to feel safe, having feelings of depression. The feeling of not being able to feel safe, I think is a hallmark of the effects of trauma. And when our symptoms are fairly severe, I think that can be a time when we want to use all of these, as many of these tools, and take a look at the 11 tools that I talk about, because even dietary changes can make a difference for depression, and maybe also even not feeling safe, because information goes through our guts to our nervous system to convey a sense of safety. And calming things in the gut can actually help reduce the messages that our nervous systems get that can trigger that sense of stress or lack of safety. Darrell also asked about, you had postpartum depression, your daughter's struggling with anxiety and depression. Could there be a connection? Yes, there could. And this is another way of thinking about intergenerational trauma is that if you work with your postpartum depression, what might have triggered it, what might have happened in your own pregnancy, labor, birth, early life with your daughter that might have had an impact on postpartum depression for you, that could actually help for your daughter. It could help also help you have more regulation for your own system. And that by itself could help your daughter's nervous system with regulating also. And part of that is because the adult's nervous system regulation has an impact on the child's nervous system regulation. That's part of how the child learns how to regulate their system. And we tend to look at children having a problem as it being their issue, but from this trauma lens, the multi-generational lens, it's often a place that we can have a big impact on as the adult caregivers or the parents or the friends or family that are involved with that child. So we have just a couple minutes left for our session and I'm going to take a look at another question or two and then we'll see. I invite you guys to email me if there are questions that haven't been addressed yet. You're welcome to email me ask me about these. Uh, the My email address, Arwen, maybe you can put that in the chat or it'll be in the handout. And if you go to my website, to any of the links that go to my website, you can find my email there and get in touch with me that way as well. So let me just take another look here and see if there's any other questions I can work with. Alfred, you asked a really important question about the BIPOC community, black, indigenous, people of color, racism, discrimination, all of the factors that can reduce our access to support, access to healthcare, um, 
insurance, having coverage, how do you pay for therapy? How do you do trauma therapy and trauma work when you don't have the funds to cover that? I think that's a really big question. It's a really important one. It's something that is missing in our current healthcare system. And it leaves so, so many millions of people stranded with chronic illness and chronic conditions of not being able to get the help that we really need in order to heal. And that's where we have to work with what we can, while we're also chipping away from the other side in a way to change the system. And I know from what you're doing, Alfred, specifically in our exchanges that we've had, you're working with things that are available and accessible to you, whether it's nutrition, whether it's books that you've read, whether it's things like trauma release exercises, which are things that you can find online and sometimes get started working with on your own. Oftentimes when we have a chronic illness, it's really helpful though to have a therapist to work with us. And so there are therapists in all fields who work at reduced rates. And that can sometimes be a place to start. Uh, and I'm gonna keep thinking on that and chewing on that because that's a big question that is an ongoing one of how do we work with healing when we don't readily have access. But that's also why I've created these lists of books and therapies for working on your own as places to start. Because there too, Alfred, I know you've also made a huge amount of progress, I think, in the work that you've been able to do also. So I think what we'll do is I'm going to stop there. And um, I'm actually, I'm really looking forward to seeing the rest of your questions and seeing what else you guys have put in this chat that I didn't have time to get through. But this has been really wonderful. Thanks so much, everyone, for your participation and your great questions. And I'll see if there's anything else that we need to do before we close out, Arwen or Wayne. I think we'll call that a wonderful session. Thank you so much, Veronique. And uh, it's such a privilege to, to have you share with, with our patients and with many uh, people from your blog as well. And we look forward to uh, maintaining this community, to continuing to, to interact uh, with questions that may come up. Um, Veronique's uh, email is in, in, the, in the chat section. My email is in the chat section. Uh, the Lifestyle Medical generic email is in the chat section. So please, let's continue this. You know, we're, we're in this world where we have so much chronic disease and <clears throat> our lifestyle choices make a huge difference, but a lot of things under underlie our lifestyle choices as uh, Veronique has uh, done such a good job of sharing this morning. So uh, when we look at root causes, this is uh, about as root as it gets, but it's uh, so important. Again, thank you everyone for participating. Thank you so much, uh, Veronique or Dr. Mead. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks so much, Veronique. Thanks, Arwen. Thanks, Thanks Wayne. Everyone.